Lubomir Luchuk is a Canadian academic and author of books and articles in the field of political geography and Ukrainian history. He's currently a full professor at the Military College of Canada, Royal Military College of Canada, and a senior research fellow uh, of the Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Toronto. In 2010, Luchuk was one of 16 recipients of the Shevchenko Medal of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress in recognition of his educational research and advocacy efforts on behalf of the Ukrainian Canadian community. In 2019, he also received the Cross of Ivan Mazepa, a Ukrainian presidential award presented in Kingston by His Excellency Andrei Shevchenko, Ukraine's ambassador to Canada. More recently, he was declared a persona non grata by the Russian Federation. And that's a good place to start talking because we did have a good chat about that before we hit record. So I guess the holidays to Crimea are off, at least until it can be retaken by Ukraine. Well, I'm expecting to get back to a free Crimea in the not too distant future. I don't particularly care if I ever get back to Moscow or St. Petersburg, Leningrad, as I knew it, or Kazan or any other delightful spots of the Russian Federation, because it probably won't exist when this war is over either. But being put on a, a, a sanctions list by the Russian Federation was a great honor. Not as great as being recognized by President uh, Zelensky, who I've referred to elsewhere as Ukraine's Moses. Uh, getting the cross of Ivan Mazepa was a great distinction and, and the others that I've received. But, um, you know, I must admit, um, I, I was amused by the Russian Federation uh, paying attention to what I've done. Um, the only problem, as I mentioned as we were talking earlier, was that when I got the the list and my name was added to it, I realized they'd misspelled my name. So I, I wrote to the Russian Federation, the foreign ministry, and asked them to correct that. I haven't, I haven't heard back, but uh, I'm on the list. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think we concluded you have to try harder there to get on to the next, uh, the next rung of sanctions. But joking aside... I'm doing, I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to talk a bit about disinformation. And of course, in your academic work, uh, there have been attempts by the Russian state to sow discord, to disparage your work, and in some ways to try and disconnect you from the academic community. They use a variety of techniques, don't they, in order to both manipulate historical memory, but also to try and manipulate the academic process of research and publishing, especially if it's something they don't like or which challenges any of their narratives. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, with a colleague, uh, Professor Voldemar Vietrovich, who's in Kiev in the Verkhovna Rada, uh, over the past decade plus, I worked on a massive monograph uh, called Enemy Archives. I mean, I think you've seen it. Here it is. I've, I've seen I've got it. It's, it's yeah. a tremendous volume, yeah. Well, it was in some ways a life's work, very difficult project because it involved sifting through thousands of pages of KGB archives about the Ukrainian nationalist movement, about Soviet counterinsurgency techniques, selecting the documents that we felt best answered a series of questions that I posed to him when we first met, translating them from Russian and Ukrainian into English. That was done by Marta Olenek. And then finding uh, an academic publisher, McGill Queen's University Press, which then put the whole thing through a rigorous peer review process uh, with external readers, and who we then had to respond to. This process took a, a decade plus. And then, of course, raising some funds to, to get a thousand page book hardcover published in 2023 is, is it's a chore in and of itself. So we accomplished all of that and we got the book out. And I'm very pleased with it because I think it challenges some of the prejudices and stereotypes and uh, Soviet era disinformation about who the Ukrainian nationalists were and what they fought for and what their wartime behavior was like and how long they lasted and so on, who supported them and what their consequences of their struggle are in our century, because of course they were um, fighting primarily from the late 20s into the, into the early 60s, late 50s. You know, what are the consequences? We got that book out and it's, it's out of print now, although thankfully it's gonna be reprinted soon. Um, and, you know, the, the results, there were a few reviews have come out, more are coming. They've all been fairly positive, which is, you know, always satisfying as an academic. But one of the things that happened that we were very 
caught off guard by and surprised and pleasantly surprised by was that the American Library Association let us know that our book had been distinguished as one of the best historical materials books of 2023. Hadn't anticipated it, Jonathan. It was a complete surprise. Didn't even know it was in any kind of competition or review. Um, so good news. Um, and we simply thought, well, good, wonderful. The largest library association in the world. Um, and then a few weeks ago, I got an email from, well, I'll call him a journalist, but I'll put that in quotation marks, asking me how I felt about the fact that the American Library Association had retracted the distinction. And this was quite a complete surprise. I had not heard anything of the sort. I went back to their website, I checked it out, and I found indeed they had retracted, and that they were apologizing for the harm the book selection had done. Now, you know, I've, I've served on uh, a couple of federal boards here in Canada, the, the Immigration Refugee Board, uh, the Parole Board of Canada, and I'm fairly familiar with the principles of, of natural justice. You know, you disclose all the information that you're going to use in rendering a decision. All parties to the discussion are fully briefed as to what the issues and facts are and what the evidence is and so on. And you discuss it and then you make it, you render a decision and hopefully it's a fair decision based on the facts, on the evidence. We hadn't heard that the American Library Association was going to give us this distinction. As I say, we were honored. We certainly never heard from them that they had had any complaints. To this day, I have no idea of who complained or why they complained or what the, the complaint was. I've written several times saying, you know, what's all this about? No answer. So in other words, some, you know, star chamber somewhere decided to give us a distinction and then take it away without telling us, but they certainly broadcast that and claimed that the book had done some harm. So this of course became a little bit of a, a of a, of an unexpected somewhat perplexing uh, uh, bit of news. Um, I responded to this journalist and said to him, look, um, I think before you comment on the book, you should read it. You know, it seems like a pretty reasonable thing to say before you write about something, maybe you should know what you're writing about. He instead drew on a, a critical commentary published in The Nation, which is a kind of a left-wing American journal, um, written by someone who clearly had never read the book. So you've got someone quoting someone neither one of whom has read the book, telling readers, viewers, what's wrong with the book, which is completely bizarre. Um, so again, to this day, I don't know who complained. I don't know what grounds. I asked Professor Vyotrovich, would he have heard anything? He hadn't. Um, a whole few of social media comments were posted with all sorts of negative remarks about us, again, by people hiding under pseudonyms, which, you know, I think as I said to you earlier, uh, I respect people who have the courage of their convictions and say, look, I disagree with you on this, or I have a different interpretation of these documents or what have you, that's that's fair. Um, but for people to sort of take pot shots from the sides without- It sounds saying, like an orchestrated campaign, it, it, essentially, it was, doesn't it? It, and, uh... it, was, it was clearly orchestrated and it was intended to, to hopefully, from their point of view, um, either disparage the book or perhaps even make sure it wouldn't be reprinted again. Thankfully, the McGill Queens University Press is an academic press and they're serious people. And they said, nope, uh, it's out of print. We're reprinting it. And so I'm pleased that uh, a second slightly revised edition is gonna be coming out, minor typos corrected uh, in, um, in the next few weeks. So it, they failed on this, but they did create a certain stir. And, it, and it's typical of the kind of Soviet era current Russian Federation regurgitated propaganda and disinformation that is organized, orchestrated, coordinated internationally in order to try to counter the truth. Uh, they just don't like the idea that the truth will set you free. So they come after people like Professor Vitroch and me. And it's interesting just to hook that into some of the recent conversations I've been having. There have been a number of articles in both uh, the Nation uh, and Jacobin, which is another you know well-known uh, left-wing journal, they now they do have some interesting writers in both of these journals. But in this instance, there's been a slew of articles uh, essentially attacking people who are questioning the foreign agents' law in 
Georgia. And the foreign agents law is obviously, uh, it's part of the toolkit of autocracy. It's the way Russia is exporting the autocratic slide that we see happening in so many countries. It's part of the political technology. So, of course, activating, uh, you know, client journalists and agents to, 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 to create this atmosphere of sort of confusion and ambiguity, um, it, it's a classic kind of technique. Now, the importance of your archive document is that it shows, I think, the full spectrum of activities from the sort of softer informational side, but it also shows the hard side that we rarely kind of get to see, uh, especially since the collapse of the Soviet Union and Russia was given a kind of free pass in the 90s and we thought, all oh, that's over, let's all move on. You show the actual mechanics of terror, coercion terror, and how Russia destroys anybody that tries to organise against their power and control. Um, what's the motivation for the book? And do you feel that the, that is actually what the book is doing or are there other motivations behind it? Well, Jonathan, look, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in a world born in Kingston, Ontario, the son of Ukrainian political refugees. My mother had been taken by the Germans during the Second World War as a slave laborer to Germany. My father was in the Nationalist Underground. So I grew up in a you know patriotic Ukrainian atmosphere, hearing stories about the whole the more from my um, a godmother hearing about uh, the depredations perpetrated by the Nazis and the Soviets in Ukraine, wartime Ukraine, hearing about the resistance to it. And that contrasted with what I heard at school. I had good history teachers, good professors at good universities. And yet what I was hearing from them was that what my parents and, and their friends had told me was all anti-Soviet propaganda, right? There was no famine. Uh, the resistance was pro-Nazi. Um, there was a minor resistance that didn't count for anything. It really didn't matter. Ukraine isn't really a country. Uh, I'm a little Russian or I'm a little Pole. Um, you know, where is Ukraine? Show me on a map. All these kinds of things. So I grew up in a world where, in a sense, there was no Ukraine. Um, that was something that contrasted, you know, psychologically, spiritually with what I'd been raised to believe. And so as I became a young academic and a graduate student, I became increasingly interested in these untold stories and were they true and, and how did one investigate them? I began my research in England in the foreign office records. I remember being stunned to discover that the British government knew about the famine, about what we call the Holdemore today, and covered it up so as not to offend the Soviets. That was, they say it, black and white. Um, other governments recognize the Soviet Union at the height of the famine. Think of the United States. Um, people catered to this idea of a great Russia or of a Soviet Union. And some of that hangover is still with us. You still see people go, well, we don't want to escalate because, you know, these are the great Russians. These are the, the, the inheritors of the Soviet state. There's this lingering acceptance of the settler colonial story that Russia, Imperial Russia, Soviet Russia, or the Soviet Union, and now post-Soviet Russian Federation imposed on Ukraine. Ukraine's independence has been challenged, has been doubted, has been, you know, I, I wrote uh, in a book once, the Anglo-American powers never felt they needed nor wanted a free Ukraine. And you had that going right up until 1991. I mean, you were in uh, post-Soviet Russia, you probably remember how there was still this kind of, well, what are the Ukrainians? Maybe they should be in some kind of federation with Russia. They're little, they're all East Slavs and they're all the same people. I mean, today we know as a result of Putin's genocidal agenda against Ukrainian Ukrainians that Ukrainians never were Russians, aren't Russians now, and given this war, will never be Russians ever again. So at least in my lifetime, I've seen not only the independence of Ukraine as a state recognized by others in Europe, in and itself, and an, an amazing accomplishment given my lifespan. I remember opening the first atlas that I bought in 1991, my parents gave me for Christmas, and there was a two-page spread of Ukraine. I went, holy cow, I'm a geographer. Look at this. There's, there's a map of Ukraine as a state in Europe. Wow. Reemerged in Europe. What I was always taught to believe. Now we have, of course widespread recognition, people like you are very grateful for, 
have made certain that the world now knows about Ukraine as never before. There's never been a time in history when people have been more aware of Ukraine as a state, as a nation, as a people. You know, I look around in my neighborhood. I was uh, in Edinburgh uh, a, about a year ago, Ukrainian flags all over the city. My neighbor is of Scottish heritage. He's got a Ukrainian flag on his flagpole. Where did all this come from? Um, you know, from my boyhood when people wouldn't know what a Ukrainian was. And when frankly, and I say this with some, you know, self, self uh, effacement, I, I was almost ashamed when I was a boy to say I was Ukrainian because no one knew what that was. It was almost like, well, why should I be different? I mean, my parents gave me a name like Luba Merlachuk, which made it a little hard to hide, but um, you know, like that Johnny Cash song about a boy named Sue, I had to sort of struggle with that. But the reality of it is I, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a Ukrainian. Now I see nothing but enormous pride and support Again, some of it from the West has been too slow, too little, too late. We all know that. But the reality of it is people talk about Ukraine. And yes, it's not on the front pages as it was of, uh, several months ago, but it's still there in the pages every day um, because this is an existential war against Ukraine. Ukrainians cannot afford to lose this war. I still think they will win this war. I don't think their claims... Um, about what peace should look like are extreme. They simply want the return of the territories they had in 1991. That's perfectly reasonable. That includes Crimea. Uh, there should be reparations. And the people guilty for this war of aggression, for this genocidal agenda, uh, should be brought to justice. And that's not just Putin, the KGB man in the Kremlin, and his immediate Confederates, and the people who've propped him up, the oligarchs and so on. This is broader now. Um, I think I've heard you say that uh, a few years ago, you would have seen the Russians as part of Europe. And I certainly taught that all my academic life. Like you, I believe that the Russians were part of Europe, you know, hobbled by a political system, the Soviet system, but recovering their place in Europe, like Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, and so on. After February 2022, I'm not so sure. In fact, I'm fairly sure they're not part of Europe and um, will not be back in Europe anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And I say that with a certain amount of sadness, and I'm going to be fair here to my past and what I said in the past, what I wrote in the past. But after the war crimes and crimes against humanity that we've seen, the, this war of aggression against Ukraine, all of these things are internationally in law uh, banned. Um, I can't see Russia in Europe anytime soon it, it they've they're beyond the pale and uh they brought this upon themselves and this is not just putin and you know some of his kgb uh clowns uh this is a much broader phenomena in the russian federation this doesn't mean there aren't good russians it doesn't mean there aren't russian patriots who uh, disapprove of and disagree with uh putin's agenda but they are far and few between. You've interviewed a few of them. I've seen them on, on your program. But they are far and few between. Um, the What I call the yellow Russians who fled um, so as to avoid conscription, so as to avoid being part of the war against Ukraine, are not uniformly anti-Putin. Um, they've gone for you know personal reasons, a better life, uh, desire not to be conscripted, and so on. And there are some Ukrainians who fled too. Um, but these are not uh, representative, I think, of the Russian populace, which sustains Putin. Uh, it has not, you know, they really need a real Russian revolution for a change. And I don't see any signs of that happening anytime soon, as much as I and you, I think many others, think that it's time for the Russian imperial project to finally collapse. I have no problem with there being an independent Russian state, but why shouldn't there be a Tatar state, a Chechen state, a Kalmuk state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know that there is, um, there are a large number of what used to be called captive nations within the Russian Federation. Uh, peoples and nations with distinct languages, cultures, historical experiences, who have just as much right to be independent 
or autonomous if they prefer, as Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, or any of the other former Warsaw Pact states. That's that's I'd even argue, yeah. I would even argue that a lot of ethnic Russians don't really benefit <laughs> from this political construct, this empire which they're prepared to lay their lives down for. It's um not really helping many ethnic Russians either. It's only a small, tiny parasitic sliver of society that actually creams off the majority of resources from this system. Sure, it's a rogue state. It's a criminal state. It's I think you've called it a mafia state in the past. Um, I think it's probably worse than the mafia. Um, you know, and this is not to take anything away from the KGB men in the Kremlin, as I always call them, Vladimir Putin. Uh, but, you know, you've got to remember his mentality. He's roughly my age. His mentality is shaped by having a grandfather who was in the Cheka, a loyal servant of Stalin, whose father was in the NKVD, and now he's in the KGB. This is three generations of Soviet secret policemen. And these are the same kinds of men that Putin uh, admires and that we discuss in the book Enemy Archives. Because when you look at that, you realize that who we're dealing with, we're dealing with counterinsurgency experts, people who know very well the meaning of that old nursery rhyme, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones and names will never hurt me. You can call Ukrainian nationalists Nazis, collaborators, war criminals. These are just names. So what? To defeat them, you have to know who they are, how many they are, who supports them, who gives them weapons, where are they deployed, how effective are they, what's their ideology. And that's what that book's about. It's a an analysis of documents that the Soviet secret police, that the counterinsurgency experts captured from their opponents. And they began doing it in 1944, even during the Second World War, they were already accumulating this material and they were collecting it and collecting it and collecting it for several reasons. One, lessons learned. How do we defeat an insurgency? You know, you this is your job. And they were professional. They were brutal, but they were professional. So they learned, yeah, they used the names, but basically they wanted to know who the other guys were so they could defeat them. So they're learning lessons, they're collecting documents that they capture in battle or when they conquer a, a town or, or capture a bunker or an, a, a, an insurgent army command post, whatever. They're collecting this material, they're sorting it, they're sifting it, lessons learned for the future. They're also, of course, accumulating information because they want to be able to eventually um, use it for teaching purposes for future generations of KGB men. And that's where Putin fits in. Right. So Putin comes to rule in Russia. You know, he's essentially an autocrat. I mean, he's, you know, the president in perpetuity of the so-called Russian Federation. Um, he's never been really elected to the last farce, the, the anointment of Putin by Kirill. I mean, a KGB man, you know, blessing another KGB man is hilarious when you watch it. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I used that same phrase in an interview earlier in the week. So it's extraordinary well, we have that same view of, uh, of well, that. <laughs> you know, the 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 uh, this sort of uh, anti-patriarch, if I can call him to refer to the Roman Catholic anti-popes, you know, this, 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 at Kirill, when I was growing up, I mean, we always sort of thought he was like an informer and so on, but it seems as he was actually an, age, an, an operative of the KGB. You know, so him blessing Putin, but What's important about this is, is Putin, his mentality, his worldview. When he launched his special military operation against Ukraine and Ukrainians, what did he say he was going to do? He said he was coming after the Banderivchi. He specifically said, you know, to translate that for the, those of you who don't know, I'm coming after the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, the Bandera movement. He didn't say Nazis. He didn't say fascists. He didn't say war criminals. He said, I'm coming after the Banderivchi. You know, later they became, you know, we're there to denazify Ukraine because most Westerners haven't got a clue what a Banderite is, right? But the, the Bandera movement was at the heart of Ukrainian resistance to foreign predatory regimes that had colonial settler aspirations for part of Ukrainian territory, Poland in its time, Romania, Hungary, but particularly Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. The OUN and later the Ukrainian insurgent army, the UPA, fought against all foreign occupied, occupations of Ukrainian lands to create an independent, sovereign, united Ukrainian state. That was their goal. Their ideology evolved. It evolved from 1929, when the OUN was established, to well past the end of the war, they were still having ideological 
discussions. You know, imagine in the context of, of war, you're still actually discussing social policy, economic policy, and so on. You're still trying to figure out what kind of Ukraine you want. But always, 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 no matter which faction of the organization, Ukrainian nationalists, or which unit, they all said, our goal is to achieve an independent, sovereign, united Ukrainian state. A state, a state in Europe, an independent state made no claims to anyone else's lands. They didn't say, we're going to take this part of Romania or this part of, of Soviet Russia or Poland. They just said, these are Ukrainian lands and there's where we want a Ukrainian state. Now, um, the interesting thing about Putin is given his personal familial background and his professional KGB role, he still sees the Ukrainian nationalist movement that's described in enemy archives as a force to be reckoned with, as an ideology, as an ideal, as a hope that was transmitted from those men and women who fought and died and suffered in the Second World War and for almost a decade beyond, who were eventually were suppressed militarily, but whose ideals were never suppressed because they came to me as a boy growing up with my parents teaching me these things. They were perpetuated within Ukraine. They influenced the dissident movement in the 60s and the 70s. They reemerged on the front lines. I was in Ukraine in 2017 on the front lines, and there were people who were fully aware of the role of Oun and Upa in the Second World War and saw themselves as being individuals continuing that struggle. Um, now, this doesn't mean that everyone in Ukraine uniformly worships or supports or, or believes in Bandera or Shukhevich or Oun or Paul. Of course not. It's a liberal democracy. There are people with different views, and there should be. But the point is, these men and women of Oun and Upa who fought for an independent Ukraine are largely honored by many Ukrainians, not just in Western Ukraine, but in Central and Eastern Ukraine, because of what they stood up for. It doesn't excuse their mistakes. It doesn't, you know, in our book, we're not always sympathetic to this, these people. Some of them out of fear, under duress, out of ideological conviction, did bad things. There's no doubt about it. But when you actually look at the KGB archives, what they collected, what they thought was important, you don't see much um, justification for the kind of um, stereotypes that you often hear about the Ukrainian nationalist movement being a bunch of collaborators with the Nazis. That is the Soviet view. That is the KGB view. That's the names they called them. But when you actually look in their archives, you don't find that stuff. Now, someone could say, well, yeah, but you cherry picked the archives. No, we didn't. And you're going to, you know, you can go to the actual archives. We give the reference in the book. Go look yourself, right? We didn't edit out things that we didn't find palatable because we're nationalists. No, we're academics and we, we put it there warts and all. You will find documents in the book about how Ukrainians in the insurgent army attacked Polish villages and killed Poles in Volyn, for example, the old Volyn massacres. Um, you'll also read how some Polish units attacked Ukrainian villages and massacred them. So there was a kind of tit for tat going on. And then you'll also find how members of the Ukrainian insurgent army and home army, the AK of Poland, who operated together when they finally realized that the real enemy is the Soviet Union. And maybe instead of fighting each other, we should be taking them on. It was a little late by the time they got to that. And of course, you know, as I say, the Soviets, with a concerted effort over more than a decade, were able to militarily suppress uh, the OUN and the UPA, although the last known episode occurred of sort of resistance occurred active military resistance occurred in 1962. You know, I was so already- really, That's really yeah. kind of late, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's late. And some people even claim that in the invasion of Czechoslovakia, some Ukrainian nationals sabotaged some of the, of the rail lines and so on. I don't know if that's true. But the, the bottom line is the enemy from the point of view of the, of the Soviet Union and of the kind of people who informed the young man who became the KGB officer, who became Vladimir Putin, who became the president in perpetuity of the so-called Russian Federation, gave him a worldview that he hates these nationals, and he was very open about it. And the KGB, throughout its record of activity, of you know disinformation operations, played on this. So, for example, Sewing Discord, which you know your website and your blog are, are very concerned with, 
Um, we, I was involved back in the uh, 1980s with something called the Commission of Inquiry on War Criminals, uh, which was organized here in Canada to look into this allegation that thousands of Nazi war criminals had somehow fled to North America or to Canada specifically and found shelter here and hidden from justice. You know, in the end, Justice Shen decided that that whole claim had been, quote unquote, grossly exaggerated, as he put it. And he, you know, looked at specific units like the Galicia Division and said, you can't indict them as a unit in the absence of any specific evidence about an individual having done something wrong. There's nothing to charge these people with. They came to Canada legally. Um, so that whole very tendentious period, you know, from 1984 to about 1987, you know, caused a great deal of friction between the Baltic and Ukrainian communities, and on the other side, the Jewish diaspora, the Jewish community. Because, you know, understandably, um, my fellow Jewish Canadians were going, wow, there's Nazis hiding in Canada? We should bring them to justice. I totally agree. As I say, my mother was a slave laborer. You show me a Nazi next door, I want him to go face a courtroom as well. Uh, so our position was that if there's evidence uh, of wrongdoing, no matter who that person is by gender, or nationality, ethnicity, by faith group, by ideology, bring that evidence before a Canadian criminal court of law and find out the truth and, and, and bring the person to justice. That was always our position. But that was what the government of Canada essentially accepted. Of, they backtracked a bit. But the point is, at the time, 84, 85, 86, we always thought that the Soviets were behind this. But we couldn't prove it. Now we can't. There's a document that we published in another book. I've, I've sent you the front page of it. Uh, it refers to something called Operation Payback or Operation Retribution. And this was a Soviet KGB campaign orchestrated in order to deliberately sow discord and dissent between the Jewish and East European diasporas in North America. And in the document that we found, and there are others now being uncovered, it, comes, it goes back to October of 85, Sherbitsky, the president of the, of the KGB in Ukraine is being, or the chairman is being told, um, we were so successful in sowing, planting this kind of fake news in the United States that the Department of Justice in America created the Office of Special Investigations and began looking into people like John Demenuk, Ivan the Terrible, and so on, and, all, and others, and created great angst and anger and tension between Jews and Ukrainians and Baltic communities in the US. And we've done so well down there, we're gonna try it in Canada. And they're actually saying, we did this in the States and we've done it in Canada and we got the Commission of Inquiry on War Criminals in Canada. Wow, I mean, black and white. Now, what we also now know is that some of the people who provided evidence to the Commission of Inquiry in, in Canada were actually former members of the NKVD, KGB and Smirsh. So. You know, you can find their books about what they did in the war, published in English in Canada, but no one in Canada thought of looking. So we have been penetrated, exploited, used, abused uh, by Soviet uh, agents of disinformation and now by Russian Federation operatives um, for decades. And I think there's probably going to be more information coming out about this in the near future about how, you know, there are fellow travelers who consciously or otherwise are aiding and abetting um, the Russian Federation uh, in its campaign to create friction and sow dissent and undermine liberal democracy, undermine freedom of speech, undermine freedom of association, undermine all the things that you and I hold dear. Um, and that, you know, we have a foreign interference commission of inquiry right now in Canada. I'm hoping they will very much will go into not just what the People's Republic of China or India or Iran may be doing in Canada, but also the Russian Federation, because it's clear to me, clear, 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 that not only the embassy of the Russian Federation, but fellow travelers, as we used to call them in the West, are actively, actively in, involved in sowing fake news, planning fake news, in order to undermine serious academic work like we've done in enemy archives, but also this kind of this kind of work where we try to inform your viewers about different perspectives. Again, I, I'm totally in favor of people going, well, I've listened to him and I've listened to him. I've read this document, I've read that document and they can make up their own minds. These people who are behind these kinds of campaigns 
don't want you to weigh the evidence. They want you to hear only their point of view and they want to shout down or somehow suppress or ban uh, books and authors and scholars and podcasts that they don't like because we challenge uh, not only the prejudices of the past, but the stereotypes that they're perpetuating in the present. And of course, it benefits them to uh, find and uh, exploit extremes. And as you say, find groups and find those points of friction that they can amplify. Um, they can't create this from nothing, but what they can do is pour petrol on the on the flames. We see this um, with a lot of the coverage uh, before the full-scale war around Azov. Uh, mm -hmm. And Azov has changed dramatically uh, mm -hmm. from its initial incarnation, um, which did have a, a high concentration of um, you know, relatively extreme uh, nationalist points of view, to actually being a, a unit integrated into the uh, Ukrainian army with people with a, with a diverse range of political views. It's no longer a an ideological vehicle in any sense. Um, the trouble is the propaganda sticks. And the trouble is that it is quite easy to weaponize some communities. I think we've seen with the amplification and uh, the protests around Israel's actions in Gaza. And I don't want to get into the can of worms about right, wrong, etc. My view is that some of those actions are, are, are almost certainly unlawful and some of them are not necessarily proportional or that effective. But what you have seen is a very effective weaponization of the information space. Uh, mm -hmm. And this old Soviet trick of, of uh, using deep-grained anti-Semitism to weaponize the environment of discourse, um, I say beyond weaponize, destroy it, essentially. You can no longer have an informed and nuanced debate about certain topics with a whole range of people because of this weaponization process. Right. Well, I mean, that's that's the whole thing. They're trying to circumscribe serious discussion. They're trying to reduce it to slogans. They're trying to uh, make it seem as if holding a contrary opinion uh, places you into an enemy camp. You know, I grew up in an academic world where going to university meant being exposed to a range of ideas and not always liking all of them, but being prepared to listen to them, to be respectful to people who held different opinions, to challenge them, but to do so in a way that moved the discussion forward. Um, I've noticed that in my own experience of doing the things I've done over the years, um, there's more and more, and it's and it certainly escalated since the war escalated, um, of just shout this guy down, um, shut him down, uh, not engage him in debate. Um, you know, you mentioned The Nation earlier. Um, one of the authors who wrote about enemy archives um, had obviously never read a book and was himself challenged by another Jewish American author writing in The Tablet, which is a much more, frankly, much more serious uh, magazine than, than The Nation, who said, look, you know, you're perpetuating the stereotypes of your grandparents and parents. You have no clue as to what's happening in Ukraine. You're just spouting stuff that you may have heard, and it's about time for you to stop. Now, I don't know whether you know, they ever exchanged any further discussion on that point, but um, it's sad to think that in the liberal democratic, small L, small D, West, in the free world, as you and I have both heard it called many times in our lives, um, we are succumbing to social media pressure, to, you know, what I call the twits on Twitter, um, to the kind of mob uh, mentality that is so, quote unquote, and I'm not going to, I don't really know that they're sensitive, but is so keen to show sensitivity that they don't actually read. Um, they simply react. I was in the House of Commons some weeks ago speaking to the case of a man called Yaroslav Hunka, 
who legally immigrated to Canada in 1954, came here from England, had served in the Galicia Division in the Second World War because of what he'd experienced in Western Ukraine during the first Soviet occupation when members of his family were um, deported to Siberia, where some of them died, where he saw as the Soviets retreated the war crimes they perpetrated throughout Western Ukraine. And from that point, he said, I was a teenager. I hated the Russians. He called them Russians. And I still do. So he joined the Galicia Division of the SS, not in the SS, but of the SS, fought against the Soviets, the Battle of Brody, eventually with the division, found himself in Rimini, where they were screened by the British, the Americans, the Canadians, and the Soviets, repatriated, resettled in England, kept in a labor camp there for a few years, and eventually comes to Canada with a full knowledge of the Canadian government, which investigated the, the background of this division and decided that, uh, according to the High Commissioner, all of the things that the Soviets had said about them was nothing but communist propaganda. So this man comes and he lives here for 70 years, pays his taxes, raises a family, commits no crimes that I'm aware of, even served in the Canadian mil uh, militia, so swore an oath to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And then one day he's invited to see President Zelensky visiting uh, the House of Commons. And he goes and he's introduced and people applaud because he fought the Russians. And then the very next day, the, the forward, uh, uh, an online newspaper, it used to be anti-Stalinist, used to be a very good newspaper, a Yiddish newspaper in New York, now it's, it's it's faded from what it was, but what blows up the story, Nazi in Parliament. And every single member of Parliament who had applauded Mr. Hunka a few days before suddenly reversed themselves and started calling him a Nazi, an SS officer, uh, uh, you know, um, a notorious Nazi war criminal. On what evidence? No evidence. None. So when I went to Parliament and I said, you know, how can you call a fellow Canadian citizen a Nazi or a notorious Nazi war criminal or a self-professed Nazi or all these things that they, these phrases, you owe him an apology. He's our fellow Canadian who's done no wrong, came to Canada legally, and he should have looked into it. Now, you can argue with me that you know, maybe he shouldn't have been there. Maybe he shouldn't have been introduced the way he was. Maybe we gave the, the Russian propagandists a, a, a real, real opportunity, and I would disagree with you. But the bottom line is you still have to stick with the evidence. And the evidence in this case is pretty clear. Uh, and no one to this day has said, well, no, we actually found a document that shows that he did something wrong. Um, none. Um, the Russian Federation called for his extradition, knowing full well that we don't have an extradition treaty with the Russian Federation. So that was just bluff. Um, a right wing Polish member of parliament who's got some very odd views, I'll just put it that way, um, said he should be extradited to Poland. Well, that was not followed up by the new government because, again, we don't have an extradition treaty with Poland, but even if we did, there's no evidence. So, you know, Jonathan, in my life, what I try to do is say, okay, what is the evidence? And this is not to say I'm perfect. You know, I've, I've made my mistakes, but the reality of it is you do your best as a scholar and you hope that your peers and serious journalists, people like yourself, will look at this stuff and go, okay, you know, this this requires a rethink of what I learned or was taught or was told. Challenging the, the received wisdom when the archives point to something different is, I think, inherent in the academic world I live in. But it's become very difficult to do, very difficult to do, because you're actually working hard as an academic, you know, and it will all complain. We're all as poor as church mice. What, you know, but look, it's 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 a good life being an academic. I, I couldn't have thought, I, I couldn't have asked for a better life than the one I've had. But it's also sad to realize that now a days in particular in the last several years, we're up against, well, I'll I'll, I'll be a rhetorical here, powers and principalities, right? We're up against states. Uh, that are well funded. We're up against embassies and all their all their activists that that attach themselves who are paid to to come after you. Um, and with social media being what it is, um, how could you even follow it all if you wanted to? And I, uh, frankly, as I say, I don't. I, I I can't be bothered to read what people who hide behind pseudonyms have to say about me because who are they? And, and this is one of the techniques is to flood the zone, flood the zone with stuff to the point where you're confused, you can't sift all the evidence. Uh, this works very well in Russia, which is like, 
Well, I don't necessarily believe these accusations, but they can't come from nothing, you know, no sure. smoke without fire. This yeah. stuff unfortunately works exceptionally well. Um, and unfortunately, people tend to try to believe the best uh, when they're approaching these kind of topics. Um, they try to uh, not be as cynical as perhaps they should be. So there's a big mm -hmm. role, I think, for media yeah, well, literacy say, here. Well, there's two sides to the story. Yes. Well, how are there two sides to the Molotov-Ribbentrop agreement? Now, I, I know I've read the, the, the historians who discuss whether Stalin was doing this to buy time and so on. But I remind my students and I remind my public that you know, when the Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement was signed, Poland was dismembered. And when the Battle of Britain was joined, Stalin was fueling Hitler. So when British pilots were dying defending your country, when Canadian merchant marine men and Navy personnel were dying in the Battle of the Atlantic, when the doors to hell opened at Auschwitz, Stalin was supporting Adolf Hitler. When France fell, the Low Countries were overrun. Why does everyone forget all that? I, I still to this day hear, well, you know, the Soviet Union was our ally. Yeah, when they had to be. Yes, they were. And yes, Soviet arms contributed a great deal to the defeat, thank God, of Nazi Germany. But once the Nazis, again, thankfully, were defeated, what did we end up with? With a Europe dominated by a regime that was no less brutal, no less genocidal than the, their former ally and their suppression of the truth, the, the failure of resistance movements throughout the Baltic states in Ukraine and in Poland to break free of that until 1990, well, 89, 90, 91, um, you know, suppress the truth. So, there, you know, when, when, when I hear people going, well, you know, but they were our friends and all this kind of stuff. No, they weren't. And they're not now. And they're not. And they couldn't have conquered Europe without the hundreds of thousands of tons of resources, absolutely the tens of thousands of armored vehicles and tanks. The U.S. provided them, the yes. ships, the railway carriages, the guns, the bullets. They couldn't have conquered Europe if we hadn't and, given them the tools to do it. And they and they held back some of that exactly for that purpose. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you know, I, when I. When I listen to those who tell me, well, you know, yes, but, um, sometimes there is no but. Sometimes there is actually only one true side of the story, and then there are the lies. Or, or if not the outright lies, the half lies, the diversions. And again, a lot of it is, is that. Let's just divert attention from what we're doing for the first 18 months of the war to what happened after June of 41. But let's not then talk about the early retreats because we were busy slaughtering Poles and Jews and Ukrainians as we were retreating. Let's not talk about that. Let's only talk about after Stalingrad. Um, you know, and again, because of that admiration, understandable in some cases, you know, for Russian resilience at the siege of Leningrad, uh, for the defeat of uh, Nazi arms at, outside of Stalingrad. You know, people should understand those sacrifices. I had um, family members who were in the Red Army, you know, and who fought for uh, their homeland. Who, they weren't fighting for the Soviet Union or for Stalin. They were fighting to defend their Ukraine as they understood it. Um, then I had people in the underground who were fighting for an independent Ukraine. So I had people on both sides of that conflict. But none of them fought for Stalin. None of them fought for the imposition of Russian rule over Ukraine. They were all patriots. And, you know, Ukrainians were disproportionately represented in the uh, Red Army. Uh, all of Ukraine was under Nazi occupation, all of Belarus, all of the Baltic states. Only something like 17, 18 percent of, of Russia proper ever came under Nazi rule. So the victory was, if you like, a Soviet victory. It wasn't a Russian victory. And again, that's another one of the propaganda themes. Oh, the Russians lost 27 million people in the war. Well, no, the Soviet Union may have. Those numbers can be debated, but the fact is it was a Soviet victory made possible by Western aid. And it was a Soviet victory made possible by Western aid by a West that came to the rescue of the Soviet Union because we needed them, fully understanding that they had been Adolf Hitler's allies just a few weeks before. You know, for me, 
as as someone who you know will spend some time thinking about the Second World War, I always feel so very sorry not just for the Ukrainians but for our great friends now, the Poles, who valiantly resisted uh, both the Nazi onslaught and the Soviet uh, partitioning of interwar Poland, and then fled to, Paris, to well, France and then on to England and fought in the Battle of Britain, helping defend uh, the British Isles from the Luftwaffe, and who served you know, in the Anders Army and served in you know, Monte Cassino and elsewhere, uh, landed at D-Day, and when the war was finally won on the 8th of May, 1945, we're not allowed to march in the victory in Europe parade in London because of the objections of the Soviets. I mean, wow. You know, if Ukrainians want to be angry or bitter at the way in which the West turned a blind eye to what the Soviets were doing in Ukraine in the 30s and 40s and 50s, your allies. <laughs> like nobody denies that the Poles were on your side for the whole war, right? And yet look at how shabbily they were treated. And, you know, I say that as, as someone who um, had the benefit of having a, a Polish supervisor when I was at the University of Alberta, Lesha Kuszynski, fought in the Warsaw Uprising, great man, great Polish patriot. You know, and I can't imagine how people like him felt about the betrayal of Poland by her allies in the Second World. You can say... Britain owed nothing to Ukraine because Ukrainians were, you know, on the Soviet side or they were collaborators or whatever. But Poland? Or what, you know, or giving, telling the Czechs to give up Sudetenland and, and, and arming Nazi Germany, arming the Third Reich with all those wonderful Pol well, Czech munitions, plants and, and armaments industry. I mean, uh, you probably know that the, you know, the, the, the Wehrmacht advanced in, 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 Good order, in part because they had Czech tanks and Czech artillery that they got through the dismemberment of, of the Czechoslovakian Republic. For Ukrainians, in some ways, the war begins actually in 1938 when Carpathia Ukraine was handed over um, to the Hungarians. But however you start the war, we all agree the war ends on the 8th of May, not the 9th of May, in the Soviet telling the Great Patriotic War. The fact is, you know, in some of these uh, instances, um, it's the evidence that we need to look at, not the interpretations. And the evidence is clear as to what happened to Poland, what happened to Ukraine. And that's why in the 21st century, if there's, again, something that is just so remarkable, Jonathan, you know, the fact that Ukraine is so well known, I've already mentioned, but the other thing that is so great and wonderful, the silver lining in this cloud of this genocidal war against Ukraine, the Ukrainians and Poles have reconciled. We understand we need each other. Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, the decent Belarusians that can still speak, and all the other nations of Eastern Europe who fled to the West and who stumbled over each other to try to get into the EU and, and the NATO alliance. All of this happened because they'd all experienced Russian or Soviet rule. You know, at that, that old canard about NATO expanded to the West and, you know, uh, to threaten Russia. Nonsense. The East ran West. That's what happened. Ask anyone in Poland or Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania, why, why did you want to be part of NATO for protection? And that's what has, needs to happen for Ukraine. Ukraine needs to be part of NATO, needs to be part of the U European Union. I think I was the only Western academic or op-ed writer who in 1991, November of 1991, actually wrote a, an opinion piece published in the Globe and Mail, our national newspaper, arguing that Ukraine should hold on to its nuclear arsenal, even if it remained neutral. Um, I think Ukrainians made a great mistake when they gave up their ability to defend themselves. I think they were naive, terribly naive, when they signed the Budapest Memorandum, giving up their arsenal in return for what they thought were promises of um, their territorial integrity and sovereignty being protected by the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Russian Federation. I think they've learned that to their cost. I think post-war Ukraine will be a very different state in Europe from what existed, say, in 2013 or 14. I think it could very well end up being, as President Zelensky has suggested, it might be a, a quote-unquote second Israel. Um, I think it will be in in European Union, it will be in NATO, but it will also be able to defend itself. And that probably- It has to, it can't rely on allies. It's it's understood that allies are sometimes unreliable and- uh... Yeah, and I think it, you know, in that context, it, it will probably be a nuclear state. Uh, and and I say that with, you know, lots of hesitation. I, I don't want Ukraine to go that way, but what choice does it have? 
Poland is now talking about getting nuclear weapons. Look at the rearmament of Poland. It's becoming a military colossus in East Central Europe. Um, Ukraine has to do something very similar, and it has to recover from the enormous devastation that's been caused. The, the human suffering is just, I mean, I'm sure you see this too. I, I cannot imagine um, the social, economic, and psychological, spiritual consequences of this war for uh, the Ukrainian nation. Um, the, the, the theft, of the, the, the kidnapping of thousands of Ukrainian children, the destruction of Ukrainian cities, of the infrastructure, the power, uh, you know, the mining, the, the ecocide that's happening in Ukraine, all of these things that, you know, others have commented on and can in more detail than I ever will be able to, but all of this has to be repaired, restored. And what happens in the meantime to the psyche of a whole generation or two? Of Ukrainians. Again, it's clear that one of the consequences is we're not Russians, never were, and never will be again, if anyone ever thought we were. That's that's I think ingrained. What you know, what the nationalist movement struggled with was binding the, the nation together. Eastern Central Ukrainians had been under Soviet rule. They had a different mentality as a result than Western Ukrainians who had had a little more freedom, if you like. In the context of war, there were these expeditionary groups that went out to the east to Mariupol and so on. I'm working on a manuscript right now about a Ukrainian nationalist uh, by the name of Volchuk, who is a uh, one of the righteous among Gentiles, recognized at Yad Vashem for saving Jews in Mariupol. You know? So these people tried to bind the nation together, and they were modestly successful. They just didn't have the time. I mean, the war didn't last long enough, but... They were also being repressed by the Nazis, repressed by the Soviets, but they planted seeds. And those seeds, I think, sprouted slowly so that today, under the impetus of this new war against Ukraine and Ukrainians, there is a united nation. I mean, I think you see it. There's no more of this sort of regional um, tension between Eastern and Central Ukraine and Western Ukraine. That's disappeared. I already saw that in 2017, but under the impact of, the, of this escalation, I think um, Ukraine is united as never before. And that, again, you know, at what cost, my God, but it is Ukraine's war of national liberation. And Ukraine will reemerge as an independent, sovereign United State in Europe uh, as a consequence of this. The cost, enormous, unbelievable. But, um, well, I, you know, it's hard for me to say this, but worth it. The very, very last topic to, to touch on before we, before we close, I think, is just to ask about the importance of your book, because it shines a light on essentially the mechanism of repression the mechanism of counterinsurgency, how Russia exerts its will through intelligence, terror, coercion, etc., to essentially control territories and control populations. How important is that understanding, given that, that Russia's intent is clearly to occupy the whole of Ukraine? We would see similar methodologies deployed if they were successful uh, in that. Fortunately, they we think won't be successful in, in taking even, even a bigger chunk of Ukraine than they currently have, let alone the whole country. But does your archive book shine a light on the sheer horror of what it would mean if Russia were to occupy more territory and what they would do to the people in those territories? Yes, I think it does. I mean, the techniques of counterinsurgency are, are pretty straightforward in a way. Uh, you know, Mao Zedong said this, if you think if you're dealing with guerrillas or insurgents and you think of them as fish in a pond, how do you get rid of them? Well, you drain the pond, right? You drain the pond and then the, the fish are, are exposed. What did the Soviets do to deal with the insurgents? Blockades of entire territories, um, depopulation, uh, arrests, um, using informants, coerced in many cases. Uh, between 1944 and 52, the Soviet documents that we include in the book show that at least a half million people were arrested or deported from Ukraine, Western Ukraine. 153,000, the Soviets admit, were executed. Um, 
entire communities were relocated forcibly. Operation Vistula, for example, in cooperation with uh, Communist Poland. Just simply take a region, move everyone out. And anyone who's left there is an enemy to be killed. Um, deportations to, to the Gulag, to Siberia, arrests, betrayals, um, not just a military campaign, which, by the way, they didn't do that well, just as in the war against Ukraine today, you know, the, these meat waves and so on. They weren't particularly skillful at the beginning anyway. They got better, as the Russians are getting better today, uh, in learning how to deal with the insurgents. So what they would do, and one of the particularly nasty techniques was they would capture members of the Ukrainian insurgent army, the UPA, um, torture them, execute them, take their documents. Sometimes they could turn by saying, okay, your parents are living in this village. We're going to kill them. We're going to deport your family, kill your sister, whatever, unless you turn and work for us. And then they would send these uh, turncoats back out into the villages to commit outrages against the Poles. There were very few Jews left then, but against Poles and other Ukrainians, as if the Ukrainian insurgent army were just bandits. So they would have these false flag operations, as we would call them, to try to turn the public against the underground. And of course, that called forth a reaction from the security services of the underground, which then had to sort of root out traitors. And in that kind of hot atmosphere, mistakes are made. Um, and this is, again, creates distrust. People fear everyone who comes to the door at night. You know, are these real insurgents? Or are they fake insurgents? Are they Ukrainian insurgents or Polish insurgents? Are they bandits, perhaps? Uh, or are they genuine patriots? And when you come to the point where you just don't know anymore, you're afraid of everything and you atomize and you simply want nothing to do with anything. It took them 10 years. I mean, the amazing thing is with virtually no help from anyone else, these Ukrainian insurgents who captured their weapons from their foes, who you know sustained themselves with popular public support managed to last for a decade a decade. There was no, you know, the, the, the Polish army, Krajowa, had the support of a government in exile. Um, France had de Gaulle, right? Um, the biggest collaboration is governments in Europe, although I should point out we're in Quisling in Norway, Vichy, France, and so on. There's no collaboration government in Ukraine, none, zero. But the, the point is, with no outside aid, they continue to fight. Yes, there were moments when they cooperated with the Germans for tactical reasons, although that was rare. And as we do document in the book, when some UPA, UPA commanders, for tactical reasons, joined the Germans in fighting the Soviets, they were tried and if found guilty of disobeying the order of not collaborating, were actually executed. There's, it's in the book, you know, UPA, the UPA shooting its own officers for collaborating with the Germans. Um, you couldn't just sort of take initiative. You had to have, it had to be cleared from the highest levels. And what we see in the book is that essentially these Ukrainian insurgents with virtually no aid from anywhere else sustained guerrilla insurgency for a decade, not only fighting against the Nazi occupation of Ukraine, contesting Polish claims to parts of Ukrainian territory, but then for as I say, many years thereafter, fighting against concerted Soviet counterinsurgency operation. And again, this is not without its warts. We don't in any way, um, you know, try to sugarcoat it. We're not always sympathetic to what they did or where they fought and how they fought and so on. But when you overall look at the story as captured by the Soviets in their archives, you see that the ideals of the nationalist movement um, were genuine. These weren't war criminals. They weren't collaborators. They weren't Nazi sympathizers. They were men and women who were prepared to give their lives if necessary to achieve an independent, united, sovereign Ukrainian state in Europe. And their activities, their struggle, their sacrifices, their service uh, laid the foundations, I believe, for the continuing struggle against foreign domination. Uh, and they are facing, ironically, if you like, the book comes out in 2023, they're facing the same old foe, using the same old techniques.
And the amazing thing is that, you know, the book, which, as I say, took over a decade to get together. And it was, frankly, always sitting here on my shoulder, whispering, Amir, finish me, finish me, finish me. It was a burden, Jonathan. I'm not going to tell you that this was a book that this was probably the worst project of my academic life. And then it appears, it appears just as this war escalates. And I realized how current it really is. And I will always remember, maybe this is where we can end. I um, FaceTimed my colleague, Professor Vyotrovich in Kiev, and it was in February. And I said, Voldemir, here's, here's our book. And he was sitting in his apartment in Kiev. I could hear the air raid sirens going in the background. The power had been blown away. So he was in the dark with just his cell phone and the light on his cell phone. And his wife and son were huddling behind him in the cold. Here I am saying, hey, this is our book launch. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. <laughs> you can't make that. That was, the, that was the best book launch of my life. And, you know, I thank God for what I could do for Ukraine with this book and with Professor Vyotrovich and for, you know, the memory of people like my parents who always wanted to see the truth come out about the movement that they gave their lives for. It's incredible. I'm so grateful to you for sharing that, for getting me a copy of the book as well. Uh, I, I dip into it and I, I find the stories in there remarkable. It, it's also terrifying as well to understand more about how the counterinsurgency works. And of course, it, it, it makes Putin's war against Ukraine even more insane because you realize if he had taken the whole country, the level of insurgency he would have faced would have been extraordinary on an even greater scale than what you describe in the book. But that's where we are at the end of this episode. There's so much good information in there for people to uh, hopefully get them thinking. Um, I look forward to seeing the comments against the video. But Lubomir, thank you for reaching out. Thank you for everything you do and for sharing uh, some of your knowledge and passion with the audience today. Thank you, Jonathan. Slava Ukraini. <laughs>